The orcs are the most relentlessly warlike alien race in the galaxy. They are also one of the most numerous and widespread. Humanity has encountered the Greenskin Menace from the far reaches of the Ahulis Sector to the shadowy cool stars, and the depths of the Segmentum Obscurus to the eastern fringe. Always hostile, always utterly anarchic, the orcs are an omnipresent threat to every race they encounter. Orcs attack with little thought for self-preservation or elaborate strategy. Such concepts are hazy to them at best, and usually shoved aside in favor of the simple joy of storming headlong into battle. This is not to say orcs are nothing but base savages, however. A quirk of the Greenskin's genetic makeup affords some amongst them the instinctive knowledge to build terrifying and deadly weapons of war, perform crude bionic surgery upon their wounded, project devastating psychic assaults against the foe, and lead immense war bands into the stars to crush and conquer. This, then, is the peril of the orcs. Unrelenting, innumerable, and bent upon endless battles. Only their anarchic nature holds them back from complete galactic conquest. Might makes right. Even a single orc is dangerous. With their hulking physiques, jutting tusks, taloned fingers, and ability to sustain catastrophic injuries, even temporary decapitation without dying, these Xenos are natural warriors. Yet, it is the simple and resilient nature of orc society that raises them from a civilization of mere thuggish beasts to a world-conquering, nigh-on unstoppable threat. Orcs love to fight. The bigger, louder, and more anarchic the battle, the more the orcs enjoy it. They will brawl amongst one another if they cannot find any external party against whom to vent their aggression. And in doing so, they establish a simple and robust pecking order. The biggest, strongest, and most ferociously violent orc inevitably fights their way to the top of the heap and becomes war boss. Those rivals he batters on his way up naturally fall into place as his swaggering lieutenants. The rest of the orcs follow their lead. Moreover, the more orcs fight and win, the larger and more monstrous they grow. If a new contender gets big and mean enough to challenge for rulership, they and the war boss will fight it out. The orcs see this barbarous system as right and natural, and it ensures that they are always led by the most powerful, if not the brightest, orc amongst them. This internecine competition is inherent to every aspect of what the orcs call their culture, and it speaks to the obsessive nature of their simple psyches. Orcs do not merely enjoy things. They become monomaniacal about them. Whether it be fighting, 
going as fast as possible, setting fire to things, building contraptions, or whatever else. Once an orc fixates upon that thing, nothing else will do. Not only this, but they are driven to prove themselves the best fighter, speediest racer, most pyromaniacal burner of things, and so on. The tribal warfare and breakneck races continue until such a time as a non-orc enemy presents itself. At this point, the Greenskins' rivalries are set aside, at least partially, to allow for all-out war against whatever unfortunate species they have encountered. Of course, such conflicts inevitably offer their own opportunities for orcs so inclined to prove they are the biggest, meanest, and ultimately best. Wherever orcs are found, a strange ecosystem develops that sustains their crude society. Odd fungi spring up in profusion, as do innumerable species of misshapen beasts, commonly known to the orcs as squigs. Different strains of these creatures have different uses. From the dribble-snouted oil squigs, or the oddly musical squig pipes, to massive strains of riding squigs, delicious eating squigs, viciously fanged gnasher squigs, and countless others. Along with these useful, if surly and vicious creatures, an underclass of greenskin runts manifests itself, divided into the simple-minded snotlings, useful for fetching, carrying, squig farming, and little else. And the wiry, cunning Gretchen. These Gretchen, also known as Grots, serve their bullying orc masters as servants, skivvies, ammo carriers, and surgical orderlies carrying out any jobs the orcs themselves can't be bothered to do. Gretchen are physically smaller and weaker than orcs, but their conniving and sneaky nature is beyond anything most orcs are capable of. This allows the Gretchen to survive and even prosper amongst orc society does not, however, prevent them from being constantly brutalized, eaten, subjected to ghastly industrial accidents, trampled underfoot, blown up for target practice, or herded into battle as landmine clearance. Bizarrely, few grots ever complain about this treatment. They accept their short, cruel lives as simply another part of the natural order of things. Besides, the spiteful creatures can always find a slower, stupider, or weaker runt to take the bullet for them in a pinch. Where the strange orcoid ecosystem springs from, or how it self-regulates, is a mystery every other sentient race in the galaxy. Theories abound that orcs originate from some conjoined subdimension beyond real space. They are rumored to replicate through a twisted form of mitosis, or through spores, replete with all the genetic components required to produce fresh waves of orcs runts, and squigs shed from their bodies. This last theory bears much credence, for it is true that, 
unless the corpse of every last orc is burned after battle. Sooner or later, a planet attacked by orcs will see them emerge from the shadows to fight again. Of course, this is a risk even if the invading greenskins are properly disposed of. Should a world's defenders put up a spirited fight, word spreads amongst greenskin warbands of a planet where a good scrap can be had. This brings wave upon wave of copycat invasions, often culminating in even the most stoic defenses being overrun by orcs. Power of the Wah When orcs gather in large numbers, a very strange phenomenon manifests. A kind of gestalt energy builds, a supernatural charge like the tension before a thunderstorm, exciting the orc's raucous and violent tendencies even as it feeds off them. Some amongst the Imperial Magos Biologus have hypothesized that this energy lies at the heart of the many inexplicable faucets of the orc's essential nature. Orcs, for their part, couldn't care less. To them, this is simply the power of the Wah. A lot of odd things happen around orcs when they get themselves worked up. Be it a punch-up between rival knobs, a Nasher squig eating contest, or the build-up to a battle. Anything that feeds the greenskins' aggressive natures also causes the power of the wah to flow. Raucous excitement generates more wah energy, which in turn drives the orcs to even greater heights of belligerence. This aggression intensifies until fistfights become riotous civil wars, races become high-speed onslaughts, and mayhem generally ensues. Nor is violence the only way in which the power of the Wah manifests. It has been suggested that orc technology works only because the greenskins themselves believe that it should. This seems ludicrous, yet it is an observable fact that no other race can make orc technology work as intended. Then, there is the manner by which greenskins are drawn towards conflict. As though by some homing instinct. Is this ill chance on the part of those already beset? Or, as some claim, are these fresh waves lured in by the call of the Wah? Reports even exist of orc warbands vanishing in storms of green energy, only to appear again subsectors away. This could be the result of xenotech teleportation. There again, it might be something altogether stranger. If the orcs attach any significance to these occurrences, they simply put them down to proper orkiness, or in some nebulous fashion, the wills of Gork and Mork. Some scholars claim that the power of the Wah must surely be the way in which orcs, as a species, interact with the warp. Whether this is accurate or not, a particular type of odd boy acts as a focal point for all this tempestuous energy. These unfortunate beings are known as weird boys. 
the lot of the weird boys is not a glorious one. Their lives tend towards the short, brutal, and miserable. The reason is simple. Weird boys have little or no control over their dubious gifts. If a weird boy is nearby, when wah energy starts flowing, a great portion of that energy flows straight into him. A storm of primitive power rages within the weird boy's mind, while crackling green lightning leaps from his fingertips, eyeballs, and tongue. Ectoplasm drools from his lips, fire burns through his limbs, and agonizing pressure builds within his skull. If the weird boy does not manage to vent this accumulation in time, it causes his head to explode as though he had stuck a stick bomb up his nose. Even worse, the resultant uncontrolled detonation of wah energy may even pop the heads of a few more greenskins unlucky enough to be standing too close. Aware of the dangers that weird boys present, most orc tribes force those odd boys to wear jangly bells and bright colors to warn of their approach. The weird boys live in isolated huts or locked away atop rickety weird boy towers and are happy enough with this arrangement. After all, a weird boy has a vested interest in steering clear of all things explodey head related. Many even carry copper staves through which they can channel away the energies of the Wa, should the buildup become too much. However, when war calls, most war bosses look at their weird boys as convenient, if short-lived, artillery pieces, and so insist on them being dragged into battle. Here, the weird boys vent their gathered power in the form of heaving spumes of ectoplasmic power vomit, skull-bursting beams of green energy, supernaturally loud roars, and all other manner of spectacular and destructive phenomena. Where most weird boys would quite like to be left alone, some become addicted to the danger and exhilaration of battle. Reveling in the rush of venting their built-up powers, these so-called warpeds seek out the very thickest press of battle, intentionally supercharging their tortured brains and unleashing devastating shockwaves of supernatural force upon the foe. Equally, there are those orcs who, possibly due to some quirk in their biology, are a few squigs short of a swarm. Known collectively as mad boys, they behave in strange and erratic ways, wearing all manner of overly colorful and outlandish garb. They have also been known to wield everything from dismembered limbs and metal chair legs to stuffed squigs in battle. Mad boys are drawn to weird boys, despite the risks they present, and, whether they like it or not, often form impromptu retinues for the luckless odd boys. When enough orcs gather in one place, a great migration often occurs. 
This is either caused by the greenskin's innate desire for battle or triggered by some cosmic catastrophe, such as impending warp storms or the death of a star. Orcs in their billions swarm into space beneath the leadership of an almighty warlord, their hordes boasting towering war effigies, swarms of battle tanks, stampedes of rampaging squigs, sky-darkening armadas of ramshackle aircraft, and countless other terrifying weapons. Being the straightforward creatures they are, orcs call such a migratory invasion force a wah. Each such immense army is named after its warlord. For example, wah Gruk or wah Badzag. Everyone is capable of crushing entire systems, even subjugating subsectors if they gather enough momentum and numbers. And typically, each is born through space aboard enormous agglomerate vessels known as space hulks. Orcs do fashion their own spacecraft, from small but deadly ram ships to the much larger kill cruisers and heavily customized asteroid junk ships known as rocks. However, any WA worth its name employs vast tractor beams to capture a space hulk or three before setting off. These immense ghost ships are, in truth, the remains of multiple vessels lost upon the tides of warp space and gradually fused together by the energies of that terrible realm. Most species consider space hulks to be the harbingers of doom, for they are often infested with monstrous beings and drop from the warp without warning, bringing death and destruction. For orcs, however, they are a gift, as the greenskins get the fun of fighting and beating whatever other creatures may have infested their chosen vessel. Orcs don't worry about where they themselves are going. They simply strap extra engines and guns onto their chosen hulk, point it at the nearest warp storm, and then take plunge. Greenskins trust to Gork and Mork they will emerge from the Imperium near, if not on top of, some settled planetary system that they can invade. The Old Ways Orcs care nothing for the deeper questions and yet many of them possess a bone-deep sense of tradition, manifesting as a conservative mistrust of anything they see as unorky. In multiple cases, of course, this is simply because the orcs in question are too dim to see the value in new or complex ideas but being wrong never stopped an orc arguing his case with his fists. Even the densest green skins can wrap their heads around the concept of gathering in massive mobs, bellowing while charging headlong at the enemy, then beating the foe to a bloody pulp. Such so-called green tides lay at the heart of many orc warbands. Their efficacy cannot be denied, even if they leave something to be desired in terms of subtlety and the survival of most of the orcs involved. 
Countless enemy battle lines have fallen to the steamroller charge of several hundred belligerent greenskins. In sufficient numbers, these most traditional of orcish offensives can carry fortresses, hive cities, or even worlds. Married to such tactics, the more traditional orc wields straightforward weapons. The ubiquitous choppas, for example, are often no more than a hefty handle with a heavy metal axe head on the end, or even just a club with several sharp rivets hammered through them. Meanwhile, such weapons as sluggas, shooters, and big shooters are all variations on simple, rapid-firing, large-caliber firearms. As important to an orc as a gun's accuracy or lethality is its volume. The louder the din, the more effective their owners consider the weapon to be. And so, perversely, the more effective they prove to be. The racket a gun makes, its rate of fire, and how much armor it can punch through are all conflated by orcs into the catch-all term DACA. The more DACA a gun has, the better it is. Numbers, brawn, swarming runts and squigs, solid and reliable weapons and armor, these are what the more down-to-earth orcs believe wins wars. The black-clad brutes of the Goff clan and the leathery old traditionalists of the Snakebite clan typify such viewpoints albeit allowing for smatterings of piston-powered claws, slab-sided battle tanks, and brutish combat walkers, the better to clobber the foe. One subculture in particular epitomizes the embracing of the so-called old ways, fused with the wonders of orky bionic technology. The beast snaga stampedes. There isn't a problem that beast snagas don't think can be fixed with a squig. Indeed, the dangerous beasts appear in such profusion around these orcs that no beast snaga is really considered one of the lads until he's lost a limb or two to their snapping jaws, or at least wound up with some truly magnificent bite scars to show off. Beast snaggers breed countless varieties of squigs. Squigs for riding, squigs for eating, if they don't eat the orcs first, squigs from which to squeeze oil, Squigs to send scampering or flapping off with hastily scrawled message glyphs. Frond trailing little squigs to wear like top knots, And boggled-eyed varieties to wire into the targeting systems of their guns. These squigs mingle with the crude war paint and the alien pelt armor of the beast snaggas to lend them an especially feral and ferocious appearance. Every orc subculture finds its roots in some obsession that enough like-minded greenskins share. For beast snaggas, this is the thrill of the hunt. They live for spotting, running down, cornering, and then clobbering the biggest and most dangerous prey. 
before claiming trophies to prove their might. The beast snaggas roam endlessly in search of this thrill, as nomads thundering across plain and desert, through forest, swamp, and ruined urban jungle. To facilitate their hunt, beast snaggas stay highly mobile. They rarely halt for any length of time, even eating, sleeping, and practicing their crude bionic surgeries on the move. A typical beast snagga tribe has at its heart one or more rugged scrap iron kill rigs or hunter rigs. Pulled along by snorting trampla squigs, these careering land barges swarm with burly beast snagga boys, always raring to get their tusks and claws into their next quarry. Around the rigs swarms packs of the tribe's best hunters, mounted on ferocious and often cybernetically enhanced squig hogs. The tribe's bosses lead the charge astride hard-headed smasher squigs and massive, terrifying squigasaurs. Meanwhile, the tribe's grots, known to the beast snaggas, as saddle gits, and viewed rather like favored pets, hang on where they can, leap nimbly between galloping squigs, and generally do their best to avoid being trampled underfoot. There can be no hiding the approach of a beast snag a stampede. Vast dust clouds rise in their wake, and the ground shakes as though terrified beneath pounding claws, hooves, and iron-shod wheels. Such warning does little to help the enemy, however, because once these hulking greenskins and their steeds have built up a head of steam, there's little that can stop them. Beast snaggas consider anything large and dangerous enough, or numerous enough in a pinch, to be worthy prey. Rampaging xenofauna, monstrous war beasts such as tyranid carnifexes, or heretical demon engines, heavily armored tanks, super heavy combat walkers, and even towering battle titans. Beast snaggas will have a go at bringing all of these down with single-minded ferocity. Their favored tactic is to employ the harpoon and chain guns they call stickas, curling or firing them at their prey until they vestoon its hide. Then, While some of the beast snaggas hang on to the chains and stop the straining quarry from getting away, the rest descend in a brutal swarm to hack, saw, and rip their victim to bits. It is because of such contests of strength that the average beast snagga is especially big and brawny. Few can forget the sight of a mob of these hulking monsters digging in their heels, flexing their corded green muscles, then winning a tug of war with a revving battle tank long enough for their mates to saw its tracks off. The beast snaggas do not hunt completely at random. Not only do many possess a keen eye for tracking prey, but they also have their were boys to guide them. These primitive, wild, and unremarkably unsavory weird boys channel the wah in its most feral 
and animalistic form. They employ their pseudo-shamanistic powers to glean visions they believe are sent by Gork and Mork, guiding them to the best prey. So crucial are the Werboy's visions to Beast Snaga society that they are afforded more respect than typical weird boys. Though dangerous and unstable, they are treated like oracles. Many are even afforded places in war towers atop their tribe's kill rigs. From such vantage points, war boys can best spy out the prey from afar, while also remaining a nice safe distance from any orcs who may wish to keep their craniums unexploded. Many beast snagas belong to the snakebite clan, for their ways are naturally compatible. However, beast snagas of every clan and stripe roam the stars, and many a war boss seeks to include them in their way. After all, if nothing else, one simply has to follow the stampede to find a damn good fight. Orky no Watts Orc technology is as unreliable as a grot on guard duty. It has a nasty habit of blowing up or behaving in ways its inventors never envisioned and has an impact on its user's life expectancy equivalent to climbing into a squigoth pen while drunk. None of this stops many orcs from enthusiastically embracing the dubious wonders of what they call orky know whats Mechs, mech boys, mechaniacs, spanners, the orcs have many names for their ever-inventing, ever-experimenting engineer cast. They are the source of every greenskin contraption, vehicle, and weapon more complex than a plank with nails bashed through it. Yet, for all their instinctive knowledge of how to bodge together every sort of madcap machinery, mechs are no less anarchic than the rest of their race. Their workshops are death traps, surrounded by heaps of junk that might come in handy, and stuffed to ever-flowing with oversized tools, half-built weaponry, chain-dangled engine blocks, and discarded, often live, ordnance. Grot assistants, known as oilers, pick their way through the tangle, doing their best to assist their master while avoiding a sudden and explosive demise. Mechs don't tend to work from plans or blueprints, instead simply bolting together whatever feels right. As such, no two of their inventions is ever exactly the same. Especially as mechs are driven to constantly tinker and experiment with new ideas. They will gladly do custom jobs for other orcs in return for payment in teeth or looted scrap. However, customers must be prepared to receive something rather different to what they ordered. Sluggas that fire glowy explosive shells, power claws that also shoot flame, armor that teleports its wearer about at random, battle wagons with protruding saw arms and flickering power shields, 
all these and countless other mad inventions may emerge from a mech's workshop. The array of technologies mechs spontaneously invent is truly incredible. From unstable energy weapons, matter-dragging tractor beams, and orc-portable rocket packs, to teleportation tech, warp tunnel projectors, electromagnetic beamers, and Mork alone knows what else. Mechs can make it all. Yet the great tragedy for their species, not that the orcs see it this way, is that for all their wondrous ability, the mechs only have the imagination to employ their technologies as weapons of war. They have the potential to make their species one of the most advanced in the galaxy. Yet, they simply render it one of the most dangerous, both to themselves and everyone else. Mechs and pain boys often collaborate, much to the misfortune of everything in arm's reach. When orcs' limbs organs, or occasionally heads get lost in battle and require bionic replacement, it is the mech who fashions the cyborg components and the pain boy who fits them. Only amidst beast snagger tribes is this rule broken, as their own pain bosses manage to fulfill something of both roles. That said, pain bosses also prefer to work on squigs than on orcs, and frankly, most of their greenskin patients would prefer it that way too. When mech boys and pain boys really get working on collaborative efforts, a dread mob is often the result. Mech boys fashion combat walkers known as killicans and death dreads. Then, the pain boys work with them to wire volunteers into the war engines. Grots into killicans and orcs into death dreads. This is a one-way trip involving a great deal of amputation and crude bionics. That doesn't stop Greenskins queuing up for the process. After all, it appears to be a shortcut to being the biggest and the baddest. By the time the new pilots grasp how horribly restrictive it is being wired into an engine-driven armored dustbin, it's a bit too late. That said, with a bossy enough big mech, or two to herd them into battle, these dread mobs are clanking, smoke-belching nightmares for the enemy. Their guns, snapping claws, and roaring saws have broken more than a few battle lines. Another high-tech and all-too-infamous subculture within orc society is the Cult of Speed. Known also as Speed Freaks, these are orcs who have become completely addicted to racing into battle as fast as possible. This they do aboard whatever scrap metal speedsters or stripped back upgunned war bikes they can get their claws on. Speed freaks gather into sizable mobs and squadrons. During the rare lulls between open warfare, they engage in raucous and breakneck races around, or often right through, 
their tribe's encampment. The majority of orcs consider such races the height of entertainment, waging merrily on which speed freaks will make it over the finishing line first, and who will end up on fire in a ditch. The craziest speed freaks of all become flyboys, taking to the skies in mech-built combat aircraft, tending towards rugged construction, minimal safety features, and a remarkable array of raggedly inaccurate firepower. These craft cause utter carnage amidst the foe, at least until they blow up and fall out of the sky. Tribes, Clans, and War Bands The average orc has as much time for formalized systems of military organization as he does for washing regularly or learning to read. As with every other aspect of their society, such divisions are as rough and ready as they are instinctive, and the orcs waste no time examining their whys and wherefores. The most basic unit of organization that can be applied to orcs is the tribe. Simply put, this is every orc that lives in a particular area and fights beneath the WAH banner of the local war boss. Tribes include every squig, runt, orc, war engine, and odd boy making a claim to whatever territory they roam across. Some tribes build sprawling scrap forts and junk-strewn encampments. Such places typically boast everything from mechs workshops and pain boy clinics to squig pens, weird boy towers, scrap iron bunkers, rutted racetracks, and the facal, stinking, fungus-infested ablution pits known as the Drops. Other tribes stay always on the move, especially those largely or solely made up of speed freaks or beast snaggas. Such tribes may live off the land, in as much as they smash everything to bits and thieve or eat whatever they want from the wreckage. Entire mobile fortresses and encampments have also been witnessed. Dragged along by huge teams of trample squigs or motorized track units. The clans stretch throughout all of orc society, right across the galaxy, regardless of boundaries such as tribal allegiance. An orc instinctively knows what clan he belongs to. This is no conscious choice, but rather a commonality of instinctive inclinations, outlooks, and philosophies not dissimilar to the spontaneous knowledge of the odd boys. Even uttering such fiddly sounding words around orcs would likely move them to violence, of course. If they bother to put a name to it at all, they just describe all this as their clan culture. Orcs belonging to the same clan favor the wearing of similar colors, attaching superstitious significances to them. Blue is lucky, black is no nonsense, red makes things go faster, 
and so on. Orcs being orcs, these beliefs literally manifest themselves. An orc daubed in blue war paint may escape death time and again due to improbably fortunate ricochets, misfiring weapons, and the like, while a truck painted bright red really will travel faster than one in any other hue. Clans are more than just a matter of shared aesthetics, of course. Orcs from the same clan all favor particular ways of war. They tend to have the same outlook on life, the galaxy, and everything, and may even exhibit particularly unifying physical characteristics. The Goff clan favor black garb, sometimes decorated with white checks or jags. They tend towards an especially hulking build, boasting many knobs and particularly ferocious war bosses, and favor straightforward and tremendously violent solutions to every problem. The Evil Sons clan produces the most speed freaks, garbing themselves in bright reds and oranges. They race into battle aboard ramshackle convoys of speeding vehicles, or else run alongside, yelling at the top of their lungs. Everyone hates the Bad Moons clan, except, of course, the Bad Moons themselves. Show-offs, one and all, Bad Moons have the fastest-growing teeth. This makes them the richest orcs going, a fact they delight in flaunting with their rich yellow garb, showy gold jewelry, and preponderance over the top guns. The Death Skulls are well known to be unapologetic thieving gits. Draping and smearing themselves in lucky blue, they take a light-fingered approach to ownership. Viewing battle as only the first stage in looting the corpses of their enemies and of their dead mates. More dubious still are the Blood Axe clan, who all other orcs view askance. Observing such practices as wearing camouflage and formulating battle plans. These rather unorky orcs have a particular fondness for sneaky commandos, mobs of tank bustas, and squadrons of very large tanks. Snakebite clan orcs are traditionalists, from whom stem the greatest number of beast snaggas. They wear leathery, primitive garb and eschew the more complex orky technologies. Those orcs who do not fit into a clan quickly become outcasts. This status in itself leads them to selfish acquisitiveness, earning them reputations as nasty pieces of work. Whether they are exiled or leave voluntarily, such greenskins become mercenary freebooters, fighting for plunder and riches while gladly allying themselves to anyone who will pay. In battle, the closest orcs get to forming unified squads is a mob. Like-minded orcs band together, 
usually under the violent command of a boss knob, then surge towards the enemy in mass. Some mobs, those kitted out with especially unpredictable high-tech weaponry, may instead be led by spanners. These talented greenskins use their mechanical skills to keep their fellows' guns operational and to stop them from spontaneously igniting. A warband, in comparison, is the catch-all term for an orc army of almost any size. The smallest may include just a couple of mobs being bossed around by a big mech or war boss with aspirations of grandeur. Otherwise, a warband might represent a portion of a tribe's strength sent out to scavenge or just cause trouble. At their largest, warbands may contain the combined might of multiple tribes, drawn together and fighting as one beneath the biggest war boss they've got. Some warbands include mobs from several different clans. Others may come solely from a single clan, a war boss or big mech gathering up all the lads he considers the best before setting out to beat up all comers. Then there are the warbands that tend towards particular cults in what passes for strategy. Beyond cults of speed and beast snaga stampedes, there are also blitz brigades made up of orc tanks and the boys who ride in them. Storm boy corpse that darkens the sky with their hunting bodies. Daka divisions that mass big guns. Grot crude artillery. And many more besides. Only when enough warbands are drawn together under a single almighty warlord does a real why begin? <laughs>